the first case, uh, and it's uh, actually all just selected by my resident. This is kind of a case where obviously you had a chronic occlusion of the left limb of the neurobiofilm graft, but now you have these pseudoaneurysms here. So I've, I've seen people put uh, covered stents across these things. Uh, I, I was not in the room when I did it, so I couldn't openly intervene. And here's the guy who's got a... Uh, these, are, these are all the same patient. Yeah, this is one case. So he's got, uh, we call this the Santa Fe Highway. I don't know why, but uh, if you have one of these crazy bypasses that starts someplace and ends up down below. Um, so can you, can you go back up in the belly? I don't know. I don't know how to go back. Just peek. All right, millennials. <laughs> so this basically, this, so this limb that ends up crossing over, it looks like. Yeah. That's why it's the Santa Fe Highway. But it's occluded in the right groin. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So we we're occluded, and we have two pseudoaneurysms there. <clears throat> So on this admission, it's really the right leg that was kind of affecting this guy. We just have some interesting uh, anatomy, to say the least. Okay, well, who, 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 will, uh, who will volunteer and, and suggest something on this case? Well, what's the clinical problem? Yeah, what, yeah. Right leg ischemia, right now. You also have a... Uh, Non-healing wounds or, or just... Acute ischemia. Acute ischemia. For the right leg. Yeah. Dude, how, how old, ambulatory, you know, speak English. This will make this a pretty healthy individual. I mean, seriously, love this. Is this a you know, viable walkie-talkie yes. person? Okay. Yes. He is today. Yeah. He's board exam. Yeah, did you have any injury on the right leg? The right leg, yeah. That's it. Yeah. It stops there. You see nothing below. <laughs> but this is... Uh, this is a problem we do see occasionally where it's just the, we don't get any imaging in the right. So is there anything else we could do to kind of see what's going on in that right leg? Operate. <laughs> you could. Yeah, you could operate. But on a redo, that's, you know, that's a dicey proposition, I'll tell you right now. And how would you approach? So if you're going to operate, how would you approach that? I just got down on the grind. Start figuring out. I mean... I don't know. I mean, you're gonna I'm shoot. I'm asking you, Doctor Aish. <laughs> oh, sorry. You, I thought you were looking at me and said, "What would you do?" I don't know. I, come to I know you know away. what to do. I don't know what to do. I mean, I, that's what I would do. So, if I was gonna operate primarily, I would probably do a lateral approach to profunda, maybe, and see if uh, if I can get that out. Uh, depending on his history, you know, if, if we have any kind of palpal pulse history, and his SFA was probably open at one point. I'm assuming it wasn't, but. Um, but yeah, you could just go right into the groin. Um, but a CTA will give you a little bit better definition um, of this, especially you know if this is chronically ischemic and you can't visualize the femorals. You know, so what's the issue with the, C or the CTA though? So your timing is going to be <coughs> I'm still right. going to largely fill the other leg. Right. So that's the most important part is you may not actually end up seeing what you want to see, right? right. Because the timing is likely going to be off. At least it is with our radiologists. Um, uh, there are some there are some better protocols for runoffs. Um, like we have a, a new a new Siemens system which has a, a particular protocol, so it's it's essentially timed in a very different way, uh, and it's a really a dynamic uh, study of the runoff. But mo by and large, you're probably not going to see what you want to see. You may end up seeing just calcifications down in the tibials and, and and not still not have much to go by. So it's acute. You could do that, absolutely. So yeah. where would you approach from the, with a wire? From where? Uh, groin, the the arm. Groin. I mean, it looks like they're from access the, the groin, go down, or access the arm, go down the limb, and then you got a catheter park right there. See where the wire goes, if it goes to the funda. It's kind of an unusual case, so we will go ahead with this. You can access the funda. Yeah, but you're going to get the same picture. I don't actually remember. Looks like I, uh, looks like I tried what you tried, say, Dustin. Doesn't seem like it was awesome, but I got a wire down to Profunda. So at least now we visualize some runoff. Not not the best thing in the world, but that's probably what he was living off of before all of this. Um, so we just tried to open up a channel, give us a little time, and see what kind of what kind of vessel we're dealing with there. But clearly, in this case, 
I, I didn't do this talk. It's my residence doing something crazy here. So here we, we definitely approach this open. So there's the fem fem uh, on the uh, cranial or north part of this and uh, the um, vessel there. You can see it's been operated on before, but in this circumstance, I don't even know what we're circling there. So there's your profunda and you can see it's kind of not the biggest vessel in the world, but obviously that's what he was living off of. So we just kind of reconstructed the whole thing. So most of these, I don't know how people do it, but most of these when it's kind of a double or triple redo, we just reconstruct the whole thing. And then you can kind of make a plan either. Um, yeah, you can do a second bypass off that or you now Jean likes to do, we're going to practice using hybrid graphs for this as well, um, which kind of is a way to give you a more stable uh, proximal Usually, yeah, Fox. I don't know if I would have used in this, but yeah, yeah. definitely, yeah. Well, the, the issue with this is we did have some back bleeding into the external iliac, which I wanted to preserve. So oh, you did, okay. I wanted to kind of maintain the fem fem and also the. Um, well, yeah, because this is the limb, the aorta by fem limb comes in here, right. and then the fem fem is based off it. So we have kind of, it's a high, high traffic area. So in this kind of thing, you can do. A lot of times we've, you know, in the beginning of my career, I would try to do an end arterectomy and kind of repair this artery, but a lot of times you're kind of in no man's land and you, you don't even know what what the wall of the artery is anymore. So if you if you do a complete reconstruction, it's usually... Um, the say now, say now the, the groin was actually infected. Um, how would you guys have handled this differently? End arterectomy and UCSFA as a patch. Okay. Part was yeah. Now, how would you how would you have done this differently? If if the right groin is infected, yeah, if the right groin was you had pseudoaneurysms there, right? So yeah, we had pseudoaneurysms on the other side too. Right. So that's the issue. So there's probably some sort of indolent infection, right? Right. So you still have, I mean, you have the axillary as an inflow possibility. You, you don't, you know, it, the uh, definitely you could do. And we'll do this on cadavers today. You can do a lateral approach to the profunda, kind of trying to get it out of the clean area. area. Yeah. Um, so that's know. where you were going with it first. I, I thought that's where you were, you were going to go with it here. This I've seen these for the first time, as you guys are. They resident sent me this on Dropbox yesterday. <laughs> I'm just looking at it, too. I'm trying to remember what I did in these cases. John, would you have done something different? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> these, you know, these guys are so depressing. <laughs> Because you, you, I mean, I think your point is the biggest one is you got to redo, redo, redo groin. You know, the chance of infection is incredibly high. You kick the can down the road and get something running, and hopefully your partner's on call when he comes back. <laughs> it's just, I mean, it's hard. I mean, it's a difficult problem. But we, this is a lot of the spaghetti that's out there. And to me, it's, it's sort of, I don't know, the biggest learning thing, I mean, you don't have any choice in this case, right? Cut down the groin, figure out something. Right. Um, it's really learning how not to be here is what I think. I think I think you're better off figuring out a way to start this guy with a, you know, something endo originally for his aeroiliac disease and stay away from this whole, you know, domino effect of, of, of you know, fem-fem coming off an occluded aorta bifem. Any piece goes down, you got both legs in jeopardy. And whereas you, if you keep it unilateral and treat, you know, keep these legs separated in terms of their intervention, I just think it's safer and simpler. And we got a treatment for practically everybody's aeroiliac disease that's occlusive now that doesn't involve too much extra anatomic stuff. That's just the way I think. I just yeah. would yeah. rather not put a bunch of long pieces of synthetic graft if I can avoid it. And the pseudoaneurysms just worry the hell out of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So, what was, are there any adjuncts you guys would use, or you guys are familiar with, in order to try and? Uh, so that SFA field? was out. Yeah. Yeah. Like and he came out with a PT pulse. That's they, what it says. These uh, are the residents. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is marketing. They just don't. <laughs> He did not come out this with these. Right. He ran a marathon the following week. <laughs> <laughs> I have not edited these. Yeah. These are what they uh, tried to present in conference. All right. <laughs> Please the loss. With yeah, all exactly. Costs. So yeah, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to probably. I would cover this every time with some, some kind of muscle uh, flap. So I think we have a case like that. We, we use rectus flap. Uh, we have a specific plastic surgeon. We've done. We actually presented at SVS last year. 
rectus Done. abdominis or, or femoris? Femoris, rectus, sorry, rectus femoris flap. And uh, we've done 30 something graft infections that way. And uh, we, I think we only presented the ones that were actually infected. And we saved 29 of them. So it really does. It's something I thought was voodoo, you know, based on my fellowship in Boston. We never did that. But I came down to Louisiana, they were throwing these big rectus, and it's a big muscle. You know, sartorius is often pretty small, and we can all do sartorius flap, but the rectus flap requires a little bit more precision. Uh, I think we have a case showing up, but anything like this, because of exactly what Dr. Wright said, the, the risk of reinfection or it being infected anyway. Um, do, you think, do you think Iron Man makes any difference? I know she used it. No. You no. don't? No. Who uses Iron Man when they're using Thank God. <laughs> the only thing is good. I don't know if it makes a difference. No, but it just seems. It's good to keep the panels out of the way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think it makes a difference. But we do use it. If I'm going to put a synthetic graft, then we use it just so people aren't bouncing the graft off the thigh or something. Right. So I didn't invent this. Uh, Dr. Mineta and Porter reported it in 1998 as kind of a way to get out of these, you know, kind of putting graft on graft on graft. It's just a, a total reconstruction of the femoral artery. Um, Can I ask a question about, in case you said if it was infected, wouldn't the answer, isn't that supposed to be go, if you think both groins are infected, you think that fem fem's infected yeah. at least, aren't you supposed to go to the middle of the graft or something, investigate it there, yep. do the clean part first, push the graft, you know, like it the graft, you're push it that way. Yeah. So if, if, you're, if you're really suspicious. Right, so I think it goes to, to Dr. Wright's question is, what's, what's the condi overall condition of the patient, right? Um, patient's really debilitated, you're going to try and get away with it. And just antibiotics. Yeah. But um, if you're actually trying to... You know, there are other ways of doing it, basically cleaning it out, doing antibiotic feeds, you know, repeat that a few times. We have a pretty good series on that, really works really well. And then follow it up with a muscle flap once you get sterile tissues. Uh, and that usually holds, and then they stay on lifelong antibiotics. Um, of course, you can take everything out, use femoral vein, you can, you know, there's a bunch of different ways, cryo, which I'm not a huge fan of, but... You know, ultimately, there's a ton of ways to reconstruct it, uh, but you know, I think, I think you obviously need to take the, the consideration of what the patient is, uh, you know, what you're looking at, because that, that's ultimately how that's going to dictate a lot of what you do. This case here looks very similar, so we're going to fly through this. There's another kind of dead end. So on this particular case, this was a left leg ischemia, and I think what we're demonstrating here is that on. Uh, CT, yeah. you can kind of see that there are some open vessels down there. See, there are pseudo This is yeah. another error by family. Yeah. yeah, and so this is just this are is. These all Batson's cases or what? <laughs> <laughs> Originally, probably. Yeah. They're mine now. What about that era, it seems like. Yeah. So this was just the case. So here we had to do kind of a reconstruction of the profunda, but I, I think what we're showing here is that on the CT, you could actually see that there was a couple profunda branches open uh, down there. And a pseudoaneurysm again on the other side. But a lot of these are not overtly infected, and you can kind of... I've got to say, we kind of got in the habit in Little Rock of, of these groin pseudoaneurysms instead of sort of rebuilding with synthetics, is rebuilding it with deep vein, leaving the limb and then just extending. So your groin was all autogenous. So yeah, you, you use same side deep vein or, or contralateral side yes. deep vein? Yeah, I mean, because, you know, if you take a short piece of deep vein, people, most people don't have hardly any symptoms right. with that. Right. And uh, have you guys it, done it a lot of that, so taking deep vein for reconstructions? For days. For days. You know, it's funny. There's a quite a heterogeneity in programs. I mean, there's quite a few fellows that just absolutely have no experience with it, and then there's other places where it's kind of the go-to vessel for infections. So that is actually one of the things. I think there's a kind of an inappropriate tomorrow. fear. There's, you know what I mean? There's a kind of a, they've heard at meetings, oh, it's a disaster. It takes all day, blah, blah, blah. But the programs where guys do it, they kind of get away from that uncertainty, I think. Uh, it actually wouldn't be a bad thing to do here. So we do do it tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so, you know, the idea is you have to kind of reconstruct. This is a fem, fem this is the same kind of case with a giant pseudoaneurysm there off the fem, fem anastomosis. And you open it up and you, you look for the vessel, it looks like this. So you, you have to kind of decide are you really going to patch that and hope for the best, or you just kind of reconstruct the whole thing. Um, 
and start over. On this particular one, we use background. I don't know where I'm really feeling behind that. Do you think but there's any, you have any sense that there's a preferred conduit? Hey, Carlos. No. I, I, like, I do like the idea of the femoral vein. It's, um, but I mean, in terms of Gore-Tex versus... Well, um, I, I don't actually yeah. remember why we chose to use Dacron in this particular case, but probably whatever the last graft I had infected is, I'll go to the Dacron one. Yeah. We soak this in Refamp and... This one, we probably did. That's probably why we did use it. I probably used Refamp and soaked uh, Dacron. It's actually pretty good results, even for redo aorta biofans, is to uh, Refamp and soak that, you know... I, I'm a huge believer, and I think uh, we do have pretty good results too, Carl. Well, yeah, we actually dissolved uh, one of the thoracic devices in the family. So actually, yeah, you had a pretty good yeah. case. So you had a case of um, a, what was suspected to be a mycotic thoracic yeah. aneurysm, and it was really just, a, I guess, a band-aid at first for what we thought was eventually going to be an right. open operation. And it You're looked healed. pretty... Huh? You healed. Completely normal. Yeah. Like within yeah. a short period of time, huh? So what's actually cancer patient from MD Anderson, they want to, they want endo, they want to do open because they want to get their schemo, actually bone marrow transplant. So we did the thoracic part first, also soaked it, uh, you know, since it's a Dacron, used the alpha, they probably soaked it in, um, in Dacron, and then we came back and we did the, actually second part was a fenestrated for the infra, for the paraversal part, uh, and they both, like in one month, our CAT scan, they shrunk by like a couple of centimeters. Yeah. So just to make sure, obviously, if you're if you're gonna do that, that it's gonna be a graph that's Dacron. So obviously, it's gonna be either the Cook or the Medtronic devices, which are Dacron, right? Has anybody done that where you soak an endograft and right, fampin? Have you, yeah. The guy, what's the guy's name that's in Little Rock from Michigan? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Latino name. Yeah. 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 Um, Maldonado or mm. Jimenez or something. I forget his name. Somebody knows him. I can't remember the guy's yeah. name, but he's from Michigan. Young guy, he's a, nice guy. Huh? Young, young guy. Yeah, he's a young guy, a couple of years out. And he's got, he published a couple of cases with, you know, delivering the device, soaking it, putting it back. It's actually a pretty clever idea yeah. for these kind of endo bridge cases, and sometimes it works. You know, yeah. the gastroduodenal, I mean, the aorta duodenal fistula that's bleeding, and you're trying to just buy time or get out of the, you know, weekend call and kick the can till Monday. It's actually not a bad idea, though. Maybe advise you a little bit of time. There was a, there was a thing in uh, just curiosity about rifampin. There was somebody did it, in, in, it was not in JVS. It was in one of those European sort of not perfect journals. Uh, but it, I take uh, offense to that, by the way. <laughs> it was very northern European. <laughs> uh, but they uh, they had looked at the uh, you know culture isolates, yeah. and I think it was about a third of them. From aortic things were not sensitive to rifampin. Period. Yeah, right. yeah. So it's kind of I don't you know at half time you're treating yourself. There's something very satisfying about the sort of fluorescent glowing, that sort of <laughs> nuclear glowing when you soak a graft in rifampin. It makes you feel like you're doing something. But <laughs> I think you have to be. There's probably better antibiotics, and we just you know I was to a guy a couple of years ago, and he had some triple antibiotic scheme they were cooking up for a. You know, for a, a commercial draft that actually would have, it would kill damn near anything. But uh, it's obviously not available in this country. But I recognize the limitations of rifampin. Well, in, in Europe, it's a lot of silver impregnated drafts, right? Yeah, I guess that, I don't it's know. It's hard, to, it's hard to see that it really works. Well, we have silver impregnated PTFB, and I'm not sure that that's been demonstrated to be any more resistant to infection. Um, it wasn't Gore who made it. I, don't know. I remember who. It was. I think it was Bart, not think Bart, it, uh, the one, the company that eventually Bart bought. Uh, I think it was eventually Bart. Yeah, it is available. I'm not sure it ever really worked uh, as well as they hoped it would. So here's a case. I, I don't think any of you would attempt to send up, but our, our cardiologist sure did. <laughs> so this is actually a wife of a doctor uh, who came in. Yeah, uh, it was right. Like her. <laughs> and, uh, so she had this kind of chronic occlusion of her, uh, you know, you, you can see severe atherosclerosis of the, of the whole subclavian with actually occlusion right at the axillary artery. And um, she did reconstitute uh, a decent brachial there uh, through collaterals, but she, would, she was ischemic. She, not acutely ischemic, but she had some chronic ischemia. She couldn't use her right arm much, and so she was complaining about it. So they had been trying to cross this thing for a while um, when I happened to be by the cath lab and said, uh, 
you know, why he's sent it to me, and we can. But I, I think that the longevity of a, of an axillary stem is probably not not worth doing. So I don't know. That's a very it. unusual arteriogram. You got to say. You yeah, she got atherosclerosis. The location of that occlusion makes you think about. I don't know what comes to mind. What, what's yeah. axillary obstruction? Uh, well, that's a little that's a little far out. FMD would be one, but it's not very common. Yeah, and a, a vasculitis. You know, a 60-year-old woman that shows up with an axillary disease is uh, temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis or whatever the hell you want to call it. But it's it's not atherosclerosis. I mean, this looks atherosclerotic because of the arch, but it's still it's a funny place to get an occlusion. What else do you see that causes a sort of a humeral head occlusion? Hint, hint. You know, the chronic trauma stuff, the crutch issues, or these little old women that have broken their, their uh, humeral head, they fall in the kitchen and they have a humeral fracture, and they kind of get it treated with a sling. Some of those, they wind up with pinched arteries and, and kind of chronic trauma. Even some of these athletes, uh, some of the pitchers, show up with this kind of an axillary artery occlusion. It's, it's a pretty unusual scenario, though. You've got to really, you know, there's nothing un, no, nothing routine about that. Yeah, so we thought it was unusual as well. I mean, we actually first approached it from an infraclavicular approach. I wanted to see what the artery looked like there. I was trying to do as short a bypass as possible. Um, but it's hard to go back to the original point, though, about the, uh, the you know stenting this. I mean, you'd have to have a pretty sick person to justify yeah. Yeah. a stent, I think, in this place, mainly because of the diameter. You'd be putting some five millimeter by something in. You've got a high, high mobility location. You know, in general, stents work pretty good where there's not a lot of mobility. I mean, it hadn't worked very well in the SFA, mostly because all those external forces and, you know, intra thoracic intracavitary places that works a hell of a lot better. So, I mean, you'd have to have a good reason. She'd have to be very frail. You're just trying to, you know, some nursing home patient that's come in, a pretzel in the emergency room, and you just don't want to do an arm amputation. So you do something, and they're probably never going to move anyway. You know, they're not going to be playing tennis for a reasonable period of time. Justify it. But most of the time, you're going to do something open if you have a you know, some kind of affection for her. <laughs> so we uh, we didn't try an infraclavicular approach to this, but the, the artery was clearly diseased there. This this I thought it was going to be giant cell or something else. Was she a smoker? Uh, she had been. I think she had quit like over the last ten years. But yeah, it is definitely unusual anatomy. But so we ended up having to do a bypass, from, really from the proximal subclavian um, down to the brachial artery. These are awful pictures, but. What did subclavian look like? Uh, infraclavicular, it was diseased. It Too was uh, out yeah. I actually took a section of it and sent it off yeah, for, yeah. for pathology, and it just came back out for So would you consider artery. taking it from the carotid? What's that? Would you consider taking the bypass from the carotid? Yeah, but the proximal subclavian was normal. But yeah, I was, I was just, in my mind, she's 60, she's pretty healthy, she's going to live a long time, I don't want to be in the bypass. So, um... Let's see what this case is so, here. <laughs> uh, so tunneling, let's, uh, let's talk, talk to Trini about the tunneling. Because tunneling is not a, right. I mean, I've, I've had a patient come see us, actually they tunnel above the clavicle. Uh, you don't, you really you don't want to do that. Uh, well, that's the reason I didn't mind making the infraclavicular yeah. incision, because I knew I was going to make it anyway to tunnel it. So, yeah. but yeah, that's the Actually, that, that, it's a good point. Uh, not, during the uh, Monday and Tuesday of this week, there were several okay. candidates that uh, did Subclavian aneurysms, first, you know, a thoracic out, arterial thoracic outlet with an aneurysm and embolization that did essentially subcutaneous bypasses without first rib resection or cervical rib resection. And, uh, you know, again, we look, there's no randomized trial on how to treat embolizing subclavian first rib, blah, blah, blah. But if you said, you know, mostly when you board exam is about sort of joining the fraternity of vascular surgeons. It's Joe Mills always says it's uh, uh, learning the inherent biases of our specialty, and that is kind of true. 
You know, we're a relatively small group of people, but we do kind of tend to think alike. I don't know why that is, whether we're just conformist and we don't want to uh, deviate from what all the rest of the candidates feel. But I think most people would take the rib out or take the, the, the uh, cervical rib out. Whether you take, the, If you have a cervical rib, you need to take the first rib. I think that's one of those fielder's choice yeah. things. If you had a huge space after the cervical rib was out, and you did an autogenous reconstruction under the clavicle, that's probably what I would think of as sort of the closest thing to standard of care. Probably second would be some non-autogenous reconstruction. If you had nice big vessels, you know, you'd rather not be putting vortex into a four millimeter distal target. Just, you know, diameter matters probably. So, in this lady, who would use, who would use Gore-Tex here versus the vein graft? Who's, who's got Gore-Tex first? I noticed they use Gore-Tex, but you'd use uh, Vein. Uh, who who would use Vein to reconstruct this layer? Yeah, the most people, it looks like. Yeah. How did you? Why did you choose not to use Vein? Her Vein was bad. Yeah, I was gonna. I was thinking about using Vein, um, but her Vein was sclerotic and poor caliber. And, but the, yeah, I, I bypassed that line. And that's actually another reason why I went in, in for clavicular first. I was hoping for a very short bypass, but I, I couldn't get away with that. It was yeah. an issue where the whole subclavian was diseased and it had to come proximal. I remember a woman really, really well from about 10 years ago. She was down in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. A nice guy down there. wasn't a bad guy. But at any rate, she had the uh, giant cell arteritis in both axillary arteries, and she had had bilateral, it was either carotid or subclavian to brachial bypasses with synthetic, and uh, she had the, the, the distal on this side was done end to end, mm -hmm. and she had thrombosed the thing, it, it, she had failed, and they redid it, and she got it end to end, and basically her shoulder died, oh. and she came in, we sort of tried to revise the thing, but she was, you know, she was sort of like a hander alive, but her arm was dead, and we did a four-quarter amputation on her, oh. and uh, uh, she was she I, she sent me a Christmas CD because she was in some chorus that sang you know Christmas songs at Christmas, and there was a picture of her. It's a very odd looking human that doesn't have a, a shoulder. You know your neck is about that long when you don't have a shoulder. <laughs> and she looked really weird from that side, like some kind of a cartoon character. Uh, it's it's I would I guess what my recommendation is. I would avoid that operation if you can, because it was it was an occluded and infected synthetic graft end to end of the brachial artery. Probably several uh, principles violated there. Probably wouldn't do that. Do you have any tips about tiling over the shoulder? I know that we've had some issues, you know, with just the way that to get the tunneler to go nicely subcutaneously across the shoulder. Itself. So it's not not all of that unlike when you do an X film is that you want to come, you know, behind a pec major. And then once you come behind the pec major, you find yourself in the axilla pretty readily. Um, I don't do a lot of that. That's the only one I can recall having to do. You know, I think you're better off being anatomic. Yeah. You know, God put it down here for a reason. He didn't put it out here. So don't tunnel out there. Tunnel anatomically. And once you, you don't come have an exposed the pec vessel, major, it's not, you're, you know, you're it's in not the axilla. Yeah. And then you can just kind of bring it right to the brachial artery. That you're was probably not ever going to use a tunnel. You know, you're probably going to use your fingers. You're talking about six inches. Yeah. Everybody's got at least six inches worth of fingers. And, you know, create some space because you don't want the thing to be bound up. If you're using a tunneler, you got no, you have no clue where it's going. And uh, I would just, you know, use your fingers. Make a bigger hole. Uh, it heals from side to side, not from end to end. So this case was a little more controversial because we have a little marital strife involved in this one. So this is a guy... Uh, who had uh, blue toe syndrome. So he we kind of, in, as part of his workup, he got a CTA. And here's really the best imaging. You have this kind of ratty distal aorta. Um, and this was his only clear source of emboli. So now have you guys used uh, the endolabsics device or something else for, for this or maybe for aeroinclusive disease? Or, yeah. So do you know the limitation of that? There is one pretty big one. You're going to use it for your disease. It doesn't have a lot of radial strength. Is one of the issues. Especially, so in this one, oh, geez. So in this case, you know, I felt like, well, 
it, it, there's not a lot of uh, occlusive disease here. There's just kind of some atheroembolic potential, and so maybe she would be able to do it. Um, but anyway, you clearly see, so the, the rest of it's thoracic aorta. Everything else is pretty clean. We did a TEE. That was clean. So this was pretty clearly the source of his uh, blue toe syndrome. Um, so she went ahead and put an endologics device in, but the problem is he presented again about four months later with recurrence. So we were, and it was definitely recurrence. He had healed up, everything was good. And, and so if you look, this is kind of the best view of it. Right before the aortic bifurcation, you have kind of an infolding of the stent there, right where the occlusive disease was before. So there's not a lot of inherent strength in the, in the endologics graph to kind of keep these things open. Because uh, I have seen people use it for, like I said, for just just for um, claudication. But if you do, you have to be careful. You can see the stent is barely open there above the bifurcation. So how would you fix that? We didn't fix it the way I wanted to, so I'll give you a hint. How close is it to the Can you see where it is? It's right there, just above the bifurcation. But the device goes to the right. Oh yeah, yeah, she covered the whole thing. Like Which I think was smart. If you're if you're looking for blue toe, uh, you gotta cover oh, it. Oh, is it coming through? Let me hang up. <laughs> um, so how would you fix this? Yeah, I, I wanted to explain the whole thing and do an aerial by femme, but she won out, so she uh, she went ahead and put a palmas in and opened it up. Now, at this point, how do you know, because it's hard, you got stent on stent here, how do you know what's going on? Do another CAT scan? Yeah, I miss, that's a good way to do it. She, um, I don't think I actually included the images because it was hard to make sense of what was going on, but she actually IVIS pre and post and was able to demonstrate where the unfolding was. Um, but weird, I've never seen, you know, you think if you cover this atheroembolic source, even if you get that infolded, you wouldn't get the identical symptoms again. And so we worked them up again for some other source. And, but again, thoracic aorta clean, See the, the echo, the TE, all completely normal. So it's really his only possible source was kind of this area in his distal aorta. It's pretty unsatisfying, you know, this whole identification of embolic source. You know, there was a there was a test a few years ago for DVT where they had a nuclear antibody or you know, it was an antibody tagged for I think it was fibrinogen or something. And uh, they were able to sort of subtract the blood pool and you could the, the concept was for DVT, but the idea of using it to try to find active thrombus in the vascular system, it, it's one of you guys ought to invent that. I mean, we need a sort of a PET scan for clot. We really don't have that. And it would be very helpful in a situation like this where you got a little SFA disease, you got aortoiliac disease, you got something in the heart. You just don't know where the hell to cover. And we just kind of go, well, we can cover the aorta. But it's, it's not very satisfying, especially after you got the thing in there and now you got more symptoms. How do you how do you know you don't get your damn wire up inside the, uh, the, the, the scaffolding of this endologic graph when you go back? That's a hell of a problem. I mean, it's the biggest drawback to this device for occlusive disease is the reoperation. You go sticking a wire up and you think you're you know think you're up and it looks fine. You couldn't tell with Ivis. I can tell you with all that metal in there jamming around, you'd have a hell of a time knowing for sure. So probably, you know, use some kind of a J, big J wire with it. You know, if you could get a Benson up through it, you'd be, you'd probably be certain, or certainly a big J wire. But you damn sure wouldn't want to go through with any wire that's that's leaning forward, because you wouldn't know for sure that you weren't in the interstices. And then you put your palmas in, and you really got it all cocked up. Yeah. Just, I mean, just take a pig. Yeah. Probably, a bear, huh? Just take a bear pig. So well, you know, could do a bear pig, pig or a yeah. That's a, that's what I'm saying. You just form it, form your pig here and just. Put it on. Yeah. That's one option. That option. Let's say there's one area. Let's say you try to deliver stand. It's hanging. Let's say it's hanging here. Yeah. Get a balloon. So you see, so you put the balloon up gently. Obviously, you don't want to be aggressive. See if the balloon is somewhere. So you know you're against struts, and then yeah. pull back and redo it. But you really do have to think about it because yeah. it's not intuitive. We, you know, you forget how this device is actually made. I'll tell you something else about the, the endologics. Is think about. Uh, I can remember a kid. I may have told you guys, but there was a kid that was a little uh, gunshot wound to the chest with a little pseudoaneurysm with thoracic aorta. The kid was basically fine. 
but we uh, needed, he was like an 18 millimeter aorta. This was several years ago. And uh, we used to use the Anurex. Anurex was a device back before you guys were born uh, that was a kind of a, it had a nice outside scaffolding and a nice vigorous uh, inside piece of polyester. And they quit really, a, it was not available. So if you just need a little cylinder that's, you know, seven centimeters long to cover a pseudoaneurysm that's 18 millimeters in diameter, what would you use right now? Covered stent, self-expanding, that's 18 to 20 millimeters straight. Cook alpha. Uh, what is it? Cook alpha, it said. What is it? The Cook Alpha Thoracic. I think it comes at, uh, at is 20 Is it that small? 18 or 20 How long is it? 20? Uh, I think 10, 10 centimeters. 10, is 10 is the shortest. shortest yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, that's only just recently been available. Yeah. So we got one of these Endologix limb extensions, mm -hmm. and I think they were 18 or something like that, and stuck this thing in there. It looked fine and went home. The kid comes back about, uh, you know, a few weeks later, and we got a CTA. And that we put the device about, I would say, three or four centimeters above the celiac. So pretty, you know, you had plenty of room, really no issue. This thing had just slid down, all the, slid down, slid down, and covered completely the celiac. And the bottom end of it had kind of opened up, and one of the little prongs had kind of stuck in the SMA where it couldn't go any further. The kid's totally asymptomatic. I told him he was doing fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> develop collaterals. It's good for you. you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, he's a skinny guy, but he's yeah, yeah. not eating that much. Yeah. But uh, the point of that is, apparently Teflon is slick. <laughs> these devices don't have any structure on the outside to make them hold in place. And you can't use them in that setting. You have to have this thing sitting on a bifurcation because it will slide. It will never stay where you want it. So don't think about using, even though on an x-ray it looks great, it's not the same device as something with an outside uh, uh, scaffold. And then just a follow on the, real quick on it, the other issue with it is sometimes you get a phone call say, oh, this patient has a type 3 endo leak. And the problem is that because you have, sometimes, you know, you get weakening in the fabric, and the, we call it blowing of the, of the fabric. And I actually have a patient, a young guy, actually 48, 49, I'm going to take all these endologics and do an aorto bifam because I think it's that balloon is getting bigger and bigger over time. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, so the thing is when you review the CAT scan, um, when it's a uniform, when, you know, so it's, sometimes it's hard to tell, right? I mean, I'll be the first to admit it's hard to tell. But on the other hand, it's, it has a nice uniform surface. I mean, it's not like, um, like blood squirting, like, you know, in the space, in the sac or something. So that tells you it's not... It's a kind of a contained, you know, it's contained. Yeah. So you know it's not an endoleak. It's just a problem with, you know, well, one of the issues with this device. But if you look there at the aortic diameter just above the bifurcation, it's not much bigger than his left iliac. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I don't I don't think this is a great way to treat aortoiliac occlusive disease. It's uh, it doesn't like I said, it doesn't have a lot of radial strength to it. It's not gonna Well yeah. let me ask you a question. Do you think that, that Two viabonds up to the renal arteries is better than this bifurcated device. You're asking me to choose two things I hate. So yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's Nellix. Yeah. You know, that's Stick essentially what Nellix is, right? Yeah. You've got two stent grafts up to the renal arteries with two gutters. Yeah, I, I don't think it's an adequate treatment for aerolic occlusive disease. If, uh, we have a case of. We, we see a lot, so that's almost a disease exclusively found in pathologic smokers, aortic, you know, aortic occlusion, infrarenal aortic occlusion. Alan, give us your opinion on this. So you got an embolic source and an otherwise patent. Go back to the original film if you got it. Uh, yep. It's a, it's, he's a, a blue toe syndrome, atherosclerotic disease. Yeah. Your treatment options are aorta by fem, conventional surgery. Uh, endologics cover the whole thing. I'm sorry. Endologics cover the whole thing. Uh, two uh, two biobonds uh, from the this sticks in mud basically from the renal arteries to the common iliacs, or some kissing stent, something else. What 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 do you think? That, uh, so this is embolic and this is embolic source with pulses. All right, all in for real. And you've already done presumably they're already on the anti flavor things, and you've looked. Elsewhere for a source. So sometimes you get people who will give you pictures of the inferenal aorta and they don't bother to look at the descending thoracic aorta. And I think that one less of an issue now, it was an issue a few years ago, and I think it's partly because 
of the division between cardiothoracic and vascular. And then what happens is we look at our place and we ignore the rest of it. And I've always said that, you know, if you were a general surgeon and you had somebody with a sigmoid colon cancer and you take out the sigmoid colon without <laughs> looking at the rest of it, it's called malpractice. And for some reason or other, the aura has been thought of differently because it's been subdivided between different specialties. So if you look at the aura, I think almost almost in every case you've got to look at the entire aorta because you, it could be coming from anywhere. And believe me, I think we've all been in situations where we identify the corporate lesion, we treat the corporate lesion, and the month later they're back with exactly the same time. <coughs> so exact, knowing exactly where the stuff comes from I think is a, is, is a bit of a challenge. What's the problem with this image? The window's not ideal. The, yeah, the window's not ideal. Yeah, it's a terrible window. You got the calcium and the contrast are overlapping each other, and you can't. You have no clue what's going on in terms of the mucosal, you know, mucosal. Is that what they call it? Mucosa, the inside of the right colon. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about colon. I'm thinking mucosa, but you got to change the window so you can differentiate calcium from contrast. Otherwise, you you know, you can sort of see the intrarenal aorta's disease, but you really don't know. And you could have, I mean, Alan, that's a very good point. I mean, you could have some little ulcer up in the arch. It's hard to see unless you really look for it. And, uh, you know. So, so one of the things, I, again, we've, we've obviously done a significant amount of dynamic MR imaging. And it's not for everything, but sorry. you will sometimes, I'll give you an example, was that, we had a situation like this, patient was having trains of emboli, and they tend to go the same place. It's the first thing that happens. And we got a CT scan, and there was this kind of sessile looking flat thing on the outside of the aortic arch. And then look at that back. <clears throat> then we got a dynamic MR. Well, this thing that was, if this is the outside of the arch, this thing that looked like it was sitting there was doing this. <clears throat> I mean, it was highly mobile. And what happens is when you get one instant in time, which is what you're looking at here, right. You completely, it, it, so if I said to you, there's a little lump in the outside of the aorta, smooth, yeah, no big deal. If I said to you, well, it's not really a lump, it's, a, it's a polypoid, it's like a polyp that's flapping, but oh, man, that's a completely different situation in terms of what you're going to, uh, whether you consider that as, as the primary embolic, uh, embolic source. So, you know, it's like one view is no view. I'm beginning to think static views of no views either. So if you don't have a dynamic MR, what do you do? What do you do? What do you guys do? Ibis. 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 I mean, Ibis is a great tool. Yeah. It might, maybe it is. That might be the, the, you know, that might be the diagnostic tool of choice for trying to find an aortic, an aortic embolic source. It's, you won't see it with angiography for sure. You know, for big kinds of just plain angio, you won't see because you know it gets covered up. And CTA may not do it. Not everybody has dynamic MR, uh, and you can actually do the Ibis. So I, I think that's a really important point.